It is good to see all of you. It's good to uh, uh, come together to worship together. I want to just say hello to all you who are joining online and in the Mask on service. We're glad you're here today too. And all of you who are here in person, we're continuing in our Roman series today. So I want you to turn to Romans chapter 3. And uh, we're going to be picking up some verses there, starting at verse 9. But how many of you would uh, agree and uh, say that we're living in some of the most peculiar time? Actually, I'd say that we are living in the the most absolute peculiar time that any of us sitting here, any of us watching and being part of this service today have ever lived, no matter what your age. Would you agree with that? These are strange, strange times, and I am, I am excited. Pastor Weaver is projecting for the future to, you know, we're going to be past all coronavirus, and we'll be all gathered together again. I'm excited for that. A couple of weeks ago, or it was about a week and a half ago in our Thanksgiving service, uh, some of you were here for that, that service on Thanksgiving Eve, and I just made a comment about how, uh, you know, here we are, it's Thanksgiving already, and we're nearing an end to, to 2020, and I didn't expect it, but the whole crowd just started doing that. Everybody just, it, the place erupted in cheers, and I'm thinking, never have I ever, you know, usually we get to the end of the year, and we're thinking, oh, wow, where's the year gone? But the response that night was, hallelujah, we're almost through 2020. Here's my prediction. Just because the calendar turns over to 21 instead of 20 doesn't mean everything's going to be different. Okay? So, not to be a bummer, but here's the deal. We're in this, and we're going to make it through this, and so thankful that God never leaves us, that he's with us, and that we've been able to continue to move forward, and we're going to see God's kingdom advance, not just in in Urbandale and the Des Moines area, but around the world, and we're excited to hear the reports of things that are going on. So, I've established that we are living in some peculiar times. Things that are going on around us are really strange, and it feels like something is terribly, terribly wrong, and we don't need to open our Bibles to figure out that something is wrong in the world. But if we go back to when God created in Genesis, what God created at the beginning of Genesis was perfect. Each day that God created, it says at the end of the day, he stepped back and looked what he created, and this is what he said, it is good. And the sixth day, humans were created, and everything else that was created on the sixth day, and God looked back at all that he created in the six days of creation, and he said, it's really good. God was glad for what he made, and he said it was really, really good. So what happened? What happened? It's a three-letter word. You got it, Rod. Sin. What is in the middle of sin? I. I. It's you and me. Isn't it interesting that we see sin not just primarily in the world as much as it is in hearts? And it's not so much in hearts as it's in my heart and your heart. The problem of sin has affected all of us, and the one thing that we all do really well is sin. We're all good at that. We don't even have to try. Here's what I can tell you about sin. Sin fascinates, and then it assassinates. Sin thrills, then it kills. With sin, you get, you get what you want, but you won't want what you get. Sin, it has had an effect on all of our lives. Here's what we know, life is short, but death is sure. Sin is the cure, is the curse, but Jesus is the cure. We're talking in Romans over these first three chapters about sin. And here's the deal, we're not gonna get the cure until we get a proper diagnosis, until we see the problem. You see, we have a generation today that doesn't want to talk about sin. We've got churches across the world that no longer talk about sin in their teaching. People don't want to hear it. 
But Paul opens this letter to the Romans and he's laying out the problem of sin. He, he's talking in these first three chapters about sin so that we can see it and so that we can understand it. And so first in chapter one, he talks about the sin of the heathen, those who have never heard the gospel. In chapter two, he talks about the sin of the hypocrite. Pastor Austin talked about this last week. If you go back and listen to the message from last week. But in chapter two, verse one, he addresses you who judge others and do the very same things the hypocrites. And then the last part of chapter two, he specifically addresses the sin of the Hebrews, the Jews who thought that because they were God's chosen people, because they had the law, because they knew so much truth that somehow sin didn't affect them. And so after he deals with the sin of the heathen, of the hypocrite and the Hebrew, Paul sums it all up and talking about the sin of all humanity. That is all of us. We're all included in this. Romans 3.23 says that everyone has sinned. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So I mentioned in the first message as we kicked off this series in, Rome that, uh, in Romans that Paul, in a systematic way, knocks down every argument against the gospel, and he shows that Jesus, and Jesus alone, is our only hope for salvation. It's only Jesus. I mentioned that Paul could have been a lawyer because of the way he thinks and because of the way that he processes. And so here in chapter three, Paul is speaking like a prosecuting attorney. He's bringing uh, the, the, uh, an indictment on the whole human race, and the judge is God. So he makes this indictment against humanity. What is an indictment? An indictment is a formal charge, an accusation of a serious crime. All of us here have been accused of sin. And here's what I can tell you, I'll give you the punchline. We're all guilty. An indictment only establishes whether or not there's enough evidence to charge a suspect for a crime. And since we're all humans, the indictment is against all of us. You and me. So, since this is you that we're talking about, you're on trial, your sin is there, uh, I'd say we all need to pay attention a little bit this morning. Here's the indictment as it's stated, and let's just read through chapter 3, starting at verse 9. He says, well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. That's the title of my message today, not even one. Let's read on. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Wow. Guess who he's talking about? New Hope Assembly of God. He's talking about mankind. All of us are included in what Paul's talking about. And I have to admit, you know, I don't like talking about sin, but it's something that we all deal with. And we're only talking about it because that's what Paul has spent the first three chapters of Romans talking about. So here we are, we're following up, talking about this very thing. There's no one righteous Not even one. All of us are under the power of sin. And not only that we sin, but this is what we know about sin. We serve sin. We are slaves to sin. Jesus said in John 8, 34, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And it doesn't matter what your background, if you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you're black, if you're white, if you're male or female, if you're rich or poor, young or old, we all are slaves to sin. So Paul addresses this problem, this trap of of people comparing themselves to other people. They're asking the question, who's better? Are we better because we're Jews? Not at all. There's, I mean, here's the human condition, the human problem is that we're all always comparing ourselves to other people. You do it. Tell me you don't look at what other people have. The cars that they drive, the homes that they live in, what they spend their money on. 
kind of things that they do or what you don't do. We're constantly comparing ourselves. And even as we're talking about this subject today, we might not, I mean, we won't say it with our words, but you might be thinking about the person sitting next to you or the person sitting in front of you thinking, at least I'm not like that. We would never say that. Henry and Doris may say that, but you wouldn't say that. But tell me that we don't think that in our hearts. There's this part of all of us in our humanness that we want to compare ourselves. But listen, our standard of comparison is not each other. There is no way I can get and stand before God and say, I'm going I'm to go up against that guy. No, we're all against the standard of God. He is our standard. We have all sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Maybe you've heard people say, maybe you said it yourself, I'm just as good as those people. Or maybe you've invited someone to come to church with you and say, hey, come to my church. And they said, yeah, you know what? I'm just as good as those people down there at that church. The reality is we all should be saying it like this. I'm just as bad as those people at that church. We're all sinners. We're all lumped into this thing. We've all, we all have sin in our hearts. Just like in the heart of an acorn is an oak tree. In the heart and mind of every person is sin. Now that acorn may, may never make it to maturity. It may never become an oak tree, but it has that in its heart. All of us, in our heart, we have sin. In our mind, it can be found in every one of us. Jeremiah seventeen nine says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. The NIV says it is beyond cure. Who really knows how bad it is? Our hearts have been contaminated and affected and corrupted by sin. Every single one of us here. And listen, it's not just reformation that we need. We don't just need to turn over a new leaf. We need a whole new tree. We need transformation not reformation. See, some of us in our minds, we think becoming a Christian, we got to start acting this way and doing this kind of thing. Listen, it's not about reforming ourselves. It's about a transformation that takes place beginning in the heart because the heart is what is most desperately wicked of all things. We need a heart change if the, if the outside is ever going to change. What good is it if the outside looks good, but the inside, the Bible says, is like rotting, deading, dead and rotting flesh? We can paint the outside and make it all look good, but it's still a, 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 a dirty se sepulcher, a tomb with death inside. We've got to be born again. So we have this indictment, all people are under the power of sin, and there is no one that is righteous, not even one. But what good is an indictment without evidence? And so Paul lays out the evidence here that sin has corrupted the entire population of the human race. The first thing that we look at in verse 11 is corrupted wisdom. It says this in Romans 3:11: no one is truly wise. Our human minds have been warped by sin. I want to read for you from Ephesians chapter 4. This is what it says, 4, 17 to 19. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. No one is truly wise. Our minds have been warped by sin. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Listen, there are some brilliant, smart people in the world today. There's some brilliant people that are sitting right here among us. But listen, Earning a PhD or having multiple degrees doesn't mean that you're going to be able to understand God. 
You can learn a lot of things about a lot of stuff, and you can become an expert in a particular field, but that doesn't mean just because you've got a degree or a title by your name that you're going to understand everything there is to know about God. In our genius, in our brilliance, in our intellectual achievement, uh, it's led us to uh, advancements in the tech world. It's led us to uh, medical breakthroughs. But it does nothing to comprehend or appreciate spiritual things or eternal things. We learned in our biblical worldview series that there are a lot of people who think that we can get to heaven without being born again. Just being good enables us to get to heaven. But those people are ignorant of two things. One, how sinful we are, and two, how holy God is. But not only have our minds been touched by sin, but our wills have been touched as well. As humans, we have a corrupted mind, wisdom, and a corrupted will. Verse 11 says the, that no one is truly wise, and it goes on to say that no one is seeking God. No one is seeking God. You might be saying, what, really? No one? How many of us, that is our natural inclination to seek after God? Psalm 14, verse 1 through 3. Only fools say in their hearts there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. But no, all have turned away. All have become corrupt. No one does good, not a single one. How many of you are feeling uplifted and encouraged today? I'm throwing all of you under the bus and myself too. We've all been infected. We've all been corrupted. We all have a sin problem. And there's not one of us that's outside of that circle. How uplifting and encouraging for us to hear this message today. We've got to understand our human nature because... Because of Adam's disobedience in the garden, sin entered the world, and, and that became part of the human existence. We all inherited that sin from Adam. We were born with a natural desire for rebellion, for disobedience, for self-interest, for looking out for ourselves first. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. How many of you can say, that's me? There's things that I want to do, and I just don't do that. There's things that I don't want to do. That's what I keep on doing. What's wrong with me? Paul's saying it's sin. When Adam sinned in the garden, he ran for the bushes and hid from God. And from that point on, we have been running and hiding from God. Because no one naturally seeks God, God seeks after us. And he sought after Adam and Eve when they hid in the garden, and he has been seeking his lost loved ones from that time till now. Jesus' mission statement here on this earth, Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Even our best efforts fall short of God's glory standard. We've all fallen short. That's why scripture says that no one seeks God. Here's what we seek. We seek personal fulfillment. We seek pleasure. We seek to escape from pain. But the motivation for seeking after God is a gift from God himself. Jesus said this, John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. Listen, we're not doing that on our own. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us like sheep. Yep, I went there. We're all sheep. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. One thing we know about sheep, you've heard this, because it comes up in sermons all the time, because the Bible tells us that we're sheep. Thankfully, Jesus is the good shepherd. But what do we know about sheep? Sheep are dumb. Sheep are stupid. And that's a word that we didn't use in our home, but it really does accurately describe sheep. 
Each has gone his own way. We've gotten off God's path. One thing about a sheep that he never says, uh, oh, uh, I'm lost. Uh, I got to go find the shepherd. Never said a sheep ever. Sheep don't go looking for their shepherd. All the stories that you read about sheep and shepherds in the Bible, the shepherd leaves the flock to go find the one that is missing. He's not, he may wander around and end up there, but he's not seeking after the shepherd. The shepherd has to go seeking after the sheep. We've all turned away. We've all gone our own way. Verse 12 says, all have turned away and we've all become useless or worthless. That word literally means putrid. It's talking about spoiled milk, rancid meat. It's good for nothing. We've all become useless. A little boy asked his his mother, he said, Mom, would you pay me if I'm good all day? And she said, how about you be good for nothing? Like your dad. That was a joke. That was a joke. Mom, will you pay me to be good? How about you just be good just because? But we don't know how to do that. We're always self-seeking. We're always looking out for ourselves. We are good for nothing. The Bible says no one is seeking God. No one is wise. No one is righteous. No one does good. Not a single one. All have turned away. All have become useless. All are good for nothing. We have corrupted wisdom, and we have a corrupted will. And it goes on to talk about our corrupted words. Verse 13, their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. So we've got corrupted wisdom, corrupted wills. We've got corrupted words, all simply telling us that what we have down deep in our heart is not good. Because the Bible tells us that out of the goodness of our heart, what's stored up in our heart, Luke 6, 45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored in their heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The hick might say, what goes down in the well come, is going to bring up... I forget. See, I'm not a hick, so I don't know this. I got to put on, I got to put on my polyester clothes and be, become Henry. Whatever the bucket goes down into the well is going to bring up what's down there. That's basically what it's what it says. Whatever's in here is going to come out. That's how it works. Some of you have some bad habits with your words, your language. I've seen this a few times, and I've, I've found it even on the internet without even looking. This phrase on a t-shirt even that says, I love Jesus, and I cuss a little. How many of you have seen that before? Okay. There's even one that says, I love Jesus, and it's crossed out, I cuss a little, and it says, I cuss a lot. But listen, our words and what we say This verse talks very descriptive about our words. But listen, the names of God and Jesus have great meaning and they are powerful. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does that mean? It means holy, sacred, respected, and revered. In Philippians 2, it tells us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. The name of Jesus has power to heal. The name of Jesus has power to cast out demons. The name of Jesus has power to save lives. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, it's the third commandment of the 10 commandments that God gave us. And it says, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go punished if you misuse his name. It's time for us to step back a little bit. You might be saying, well, pastor, you know, I might use the the Lord's name in vain once in a while, but I don't really mean anything by it. Let me just get up on my soapbox for just a moment, because I've done this before with these three letters OMG. And so those of you that have been around have heard me talk about this before, but what, is that, what does that mean? 
It, it's text language. It's become real popular with text language. Oh my goodness. No, that's not what they're saying. That's, that may be what you're saying. But, but everybody else has taken it as, oh my God. And you say, as Christians, we, we, we're, we're, we're texting, oh my gosh. But listen, gosh, golly, geez, gee, those have been around since the 1700s, and they're just other names for God. It's the way to say God's name without saying God's name. But you go back to the scribes who were writing uh, scriptures back in the days when they writ, wrote everything by hand. It was all handwritten. They would tremble and not even completely, fully write the name of God so that they wouldn't misuse it. They were so fearful and so respectful of God's name that they didn't even want to write it wrong. Let's take out the vowels so we can't even really pronounce it because, and not even try to pronounce it because we don't want to do it in a wrong way. But yet we, we throw God's name around like it's, like it's common and ordinary and we attach it to a whole lot of other words that aren't pleasant. And it's not just the world out there, it's Christians that are doing the same thing. I will not type OMG for that very reason, because I don't want to even go there to make it think. In our home, with our kids growing up, you can ask any of my kids, we would not say, gosh, even for God. Oh my gosh, that doesn't happen in our home. Don't say, geez. It's because of respect out of God's name. I don't even want something that's close to that. So we can get on a whole tangent here that I'm not going there, but I'm saying, let's think about our words and our language of what we're saying. Listen, ABC did a news story on September 21st, 2009. You can go search it up on the web. It would be interesting for you to take time to watch a, a, a segment or read that article by ABC News, secular news media, about the words OMG, the letters OMG. Back when texting was just far, starting to happen, and uh, that was, uh, and the respect that they came with about the name of God in that article, it's amazing. I think we need to be careful what we're doing. So what we end up doing is making God just common, ordinary, everyday language when we use him as a curse word. So we can argue what it means to us, but the reality is it's not up to us to decide. The commandment says the Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. So an indictment is being brought that there's none good, there's not even one. Our will is corrupted, our wisdom is corrupted, our words are corrupted, and our ways are corrupted. Verse 15 and 16, they rush to murder. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. Take time to read the newspaper. Any newspaper across America. Any newspaper in the world for that matter. Take time to, to watch the news. Matter of fact, don't watch the news. Because I don't know what I'm hearing if it's even truth. What is it that we're hearing? We're hearing about corruption at every level. We're hearing about lies, false charges, violence, rioting, human trafficking, child abuse, abortion, war. It's one conflict after another. It's overwhelming, to be honest with you. It feels like we might be on the threshold of the end of days. Like the rapture could happen any time, the tribulation. Sin has turned our world into a madhouse. But the indictment continues, and he gives his crowning charge, the last of the charges of his evidence that he's bringing, and that is man's corrupted worship. Verse 18, they have no fear of God at all. You would think that understanding and hearing our condition that we would throw ourselves prostrate on the ground and say, oh God, I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness, but not in our world. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But he's saying that there is no one that fears the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 1, 7, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. What is the fear of God? 
It's holding God in reverence and holy awe. Seeing God and recognize him for who he is, his power and his strength, his beauty, his holiness, his awesomeness. God is so much above and beyond who we are, and he is, he is in control. Titus 3, 5 says he saved us not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. Paul said these words in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Anything that I could account to my name, any accomplishments, any possessions, anything that I have gained in this life, he says, I now consider them garbage. A total loss in comparison to Christ and what I gained with him. So what does he mean by loss? He's saying that even the good things are bad things if they become a substitute for the best thing. Even good things become bad things if they're a substitute for the best things. So I want you to imagine you're flying in a plane, and this is 2020, so this makes complete sense. You're flying in an airplane, and it's announced, we're going down. This plane is going to crash. And you grab what you think is a parachute, but it's your backpack. And you jump out of the plane with your backpack. Is that a good thing? A bad thing? There's nothing wrong with a backpack. As a matter of fact, it probably has some of your most prized possessions in it. You're traveling with it. It's got good stuff in there. I've traveled with a backpack and I've been robbed and my backpack has been stolen. And I can tell you that is a total violation. So there's nothing wrong with the backpack. It wasn't like it was a bad thing. It just wasn't the right thing. It's not going to save you. So all of your things, all of your possessions, all of the things that you would say, these are my things... It was a choice to take that, but it wasn't the best choice to save your life. Adrian Rogers, the famous preacher, said, the worst form of badness may be human goodness, when that human goodness becomes a substitute for salvation. There is no way that we can be saved by our good works. There is none that are righteous, not even one. No backpack full of good works is going to save you. We need to give ourselves completely to Jesus. He died on the cross. He paid the price for our sin to redeem us and to save us from our sin and to save us for himself. You can't add anything to what Jesus did. But because of what he did, we live to honor him, to love him, to fear him, to respect him, to revere him, and to worship him. I'm going to invite the musicians to come. So the indictment is made, the evidence is presented, and then God gives the verdict. And he doesn't depend on the jury to do this. He himself is the judge, and here is the verdict, and we read it in verses 19 and 20. Obviously, he says, the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. The law doesn't save us. All the law does, all this does, is shows us how sinful we are. It's like a mirror, and we see ourselves against God's standard, and we know that we all fall short. Being good enough, doing the things written in here are not good enough. So, so you're saying, Pastor Jeff, that this isn't important, that we don't have to do that? Absolutely not. But listen, your good works, the things that you do, can never and will never save you. It's only Jesus and what he's done. The entire world is guilty and there is no excuses. You can't make an excuse in this life and you can't make an excuse standing before God why you live the way that you did. So what we come to is mankind is lost and now in mercy, the judge steps down from the bench. God Almighty steps down from his bench as judge and says, listen, I don't want to be your judge. I want to be your savior. I want to take your place. 
And that's how he made a way for us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm looking across the room and I see some amazing people and I know that there's amazing people that are joining us online who love you guys so much. And it's not mean for me to tell you that you all are a bunch of worthless, useless, terrible, awful, sinful, rancid, spoiled sinners. But Jesus... God's son took our place. Today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you don't know him as your savior, would you open your heart to him and say yes? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just looking around the room and today, maybe you, maybe you have never opened your heart and invited Jesus to be your savior. Listen, maybe you've been coming to church for 50 years. You've given your life to Christ, but you realize right now you have been operating in your own abilities. You've been doing your own thing, thinking that that's what's going to be good enough. It's cleaning up the outside and making it look good for everybody else. But the reality is, is inside, it's as rotten as can be. All of us need to continually bring ourselves to the Lord to say, God, here I am. So this morning, if that's you, free gift has been extended to you. Jesus took your place to take the punishment of your sin so that you could be free and have salvation and eternal life. If that's you this morning, you say, I want to take advantage of that. Even if you've been walking with Jesus for a long time and you realize today that you need a recommitment, listen, every day, we need to come back to this place of saying, I'm a sinful person, and I need you, Jesus. How many of you say, I need Jesus today? Raise your hand and keep it raised. Jesus, we need you. Lord, I pray for every person in this room, for every person watching, joining us online. Lord, you're speaking to our hearts, helping us to recognize and realize that we're lost without you. We ask that you'd forgive us of our sins. Thank you for dying in our place. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for making a way for us. We can't make it on our own. We need you, Jesus. And we invite you to be Lord of our lives so that we might walk after you every day of our life here on this earth and experience eternal life in heaven with you someday. Thank you for saving us, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you stand with me? The song that we sang earlier just brings this picture into reality that Jesus came for lost, dying, hurting, sinful people. Let's worship him. Let me just read a couple of verses past our reading today. Verse 21, Romans chapter 3. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Just as we've all sinned, we're all, it's made available to every one of us. Listen. Some people get frustrated at those maybe who have battled with alcoholism that they'll, they'll perpetually say, I'm an alcoholic. Why do they keep doing that? And I think it's important that they remember, just as it's important for us to remember and be okay saying, you know what, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not better than you. I'm just as bad as you. But I've got the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And if I keep admitting who I am and allowing him to be who he is, it makes me something incredible. Such a great thing. Amen? Amen. So it's okay. I know this is not the most uplifting message to talk about how terrible sinners we are. But it brings us to a truth. That we've been given life free as a gift.